yes so write down the heading states of matter just give me one minute Okay, so we're going to start with the next chapter that is states of matter. Okay, so you see, um, when you talk about the states of any matter, generally at normal condition, we have three different states of matter that is solid, liquid, and gas, normal condition, right? Apart from this, we have two more, that is Bohr-Einstein and plasma, two more states we have, but that is not possible at normal condition, okay? So mainly we'll talk about these three states of matter, okay? All these three states of matter, if you see, are interconvertible. Interconvertible. We can convert solid into liquid or liquid into solid or solid into gas, liquid into gas or anything. Right? Right by changing by temperature and pressure. Okay? So first of all, what is the reason why these three states of matter we have? Okay? So uh, we have these three states of matter here. Okay, the reason is, the main reason is intermolecular force, IMF. All the three states of matter has different, different intermolecular force. Intermolecular force. In fact, we have a range of intermolecular force, IMF, for the matter to be in solid state or liquid state or gaseous state. So what we can say, if this is the scale of intermolecular force, right, we can say for a certain range, for a certain range, it exists as gas, right? Then for a certain range, it exists as liquid, and then for a certain range, it exists as solid. So point I'm trying to make for any matter to be in solid state, we have a definite value of intermolecular force, which falls in this range. 
for molecule to be in liquid state, we have again a definite value falls in this range and gas will have a definite value falls in this range. Okay, so gaseous particles have very weak intermolecular force. Very weak IMF, intermolecular force of attraction. Liquid has, liquid molecules also has weak IMF, weak intermolecular force of attraction. Solid has a strong IMF, intermolecular force of attraction. Okay. That's why you see solid molecules are rigid. They do not move, right? Liquid can flow because the intermolecular force is very weak. And gas has random motion. It travels in all direction because there is no intermolecular force or very weak intermolecular force we have over there. The point I'm trying to make is if you try to, if you keep on increasing the intermolecular force, IMF, if you keep on increasing, right? For a certain range, it will be in gaseous state. Then if you increase the intermolecular force beyond this point, the gas starts converting into liquid. Then for this range, it will be in liquid state. And then further you increase, liquid converts into solid. Hence the three interconvertible phase that we have, solid, liquid, and gas, gas can we, uh, no, you know, you know, we can interchange these three states by changing the intermolecular force. So main criteria is what? Main criteria here is intermolecular force of attraction. Like I said, for a given set of, uh, you know, given range of intermolecular force, it is solid, then it is liquid, then it is gas, okay? So it depends upon what is the intermolecular force we have to get the state of the matter. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. Now you see, if you want to define the position of an object, okay, how do we do that? We'll take the, um, we'll take the reference point, right? We'll take the Cartesian system to define the location of a point. Okay. Cartesian system we do. Similarly for gaseous particles also, there will be some system we can adopt in order to specify the position of the gases. Okay. And to specify the position, we use, we use what? To specify the position, we use two, three different, different variables. Okay. And what is that variables? The variables that we use to specify the position of a gas is PV and T mainly. And to some extent, we have amount of gas also. Understood? So pressure, volume, and temperature, and then number of moles or amount of gas are the variables we use to define the position of a gas. Okay, so what are the variables? First of all, you see here the gaseous variables or gaseous variables we have. Once again.
Yeah. Yeah, so the first variables we have, that is the mass. Write down. This mass will take the total mass of the of the gaseous molecules. Basically, amount we have, we can take number of moles also here. Gaseous molecules. Just a sec. Okay. Next is the second one is the volume. Write down quickly. Volume. It is the available space. Volume is nothing but the available space for the gases. Right, unit you must take care of. The unit of volume is meter cube or one meter cube. We can write 10 to the power three decimeter cube is equals to 10 to the power three Tokyo. liter Tokyo. is equals to 10 to the power six. Should I keep going? One sec. Okay, 10 to the power 3 liter, which will have 10 to the power 6 ml, and then 10 to the 6 ml is nothing but 10 to the 6 centimeter cube, right? All this relation here. So basically, 1 meter cube, what we have to keep in mind, 1 meter cube is equal to 1000 liter, right? And 1 ml is equal to 1 centimeter cube the relation we have. Before ML, what is there? This one, 10 to the power 6 ML. 10 to the power 6 ML it is. Shut up. Oh, this is equals to. Okay. Ten to the power three liter. This one is liter. Okay. Now the next variable we have, the third one, is temperature. Temperature basically measures the degree of hotness or coldness. The unit of temperature is, you know, it's degree Celsius, degree Fahrenheit, degree Celsius or Kelvin. Mostly in this chapter, we use Kelvin uh, for the solve, to solve the question, right? And the relation we have C minus zero by 100 is equals to K minus 273 by 100 equals to F minus 32 by 180. Mostly we use temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so we always use this in Kelvin. You notice this. Okay, so write down this note. We always keep temperature in Kelvin here. Temperature always in Kelvin. Fourth one, and the last parameter is pressure. Is P. So pressure is force per unit area. So it is the force acting per unit area. acting per unit area. So P is equals to F 
phi a four square unit area f by a its cgs its mks unit is mks unit of force is newton per meter square area is meter square force is newton if you talk about the cgs unit cgs unit is dyne for force so dyne per centimeter square okay one newton is equals to 10 to the power 5 dyne and one newton per meter square is 10 dyne per centimeter square So these are the four gaseous variable you can say or gaseous parameters we have which we use for the to define the position of a gas Okay, now these variables has certain relation at a given condition that we call it as the gaseous law. Okay, so we'll do next the gaseous law one sec. So we have uh, yeah. So the pressure unit I have given you. But mainly in this chapter, the unit of pressure we use in atmospheric. Okay, so relation of atmospheric is very important here. So you see here, this unit of pressure, we have one atmosphere, that is one ATM, is equals to 76 centimeter of Hg. This is equals to 760 mm of hg 760 mm is nothing but 760 tor so 1 mm hg is equals to 1 tor we have this we also write it as 1.01 .01, sorry it is uh, 1.01325 into 10 to the power 5 Newton per meter square, right? Which we also write it as one zero one point three two five kilo pascal. So basically, Newton per meter square is nothing but pascal. Both are the same thing. Newton per meter square is pascal, and one point zero one. 325 bar it is. So all these relation of pressure we have here. Okay, so what do you understand by this term 76 centimeter of Hg? Could you explain how the pressure we define as 76 centimeter of Hg? Yeah, it is the height of the mercury, right? So basically what happens, liquid exerts pressure because of its height, okay? If you see this, suppose this is a river. This is the river we have, suppose, right? So at the same level in the river, will have the same pressure, means pressure at this point is P 
So at, along this, all these points at the same level, the pressure is P only, okay? On the same level, we have the same pressure. But as the depth of the river increases, the pressure also increases. This, the pressure here is lesser than the pressure we have here. And here we have the pressure more than the pressure we have here. Because we know the pressure of, because of the liquid is equals to rho G H, where H is the height, right? So here the height is this, from the surface to this, this is the H height we have. Similarly, at this height, the pressure will have some value, but this value is obviously lower than this value because height is more over here. Rho is same, it is the density of the liquid. So same water we have everywhere, right? It's water only, so rho will be same. H varies with pressure, right? Means pressure varies with H. So that's why what happens as we go deeper into the river, okay? The pressure starts building up with the depth, okay? And hence the diver, you know, they starts bleeding sometimes because of the high pressure of the water, right? So beyond a certain point, if you go deeper into the sea, you know, it's difficult to take, uh, difficult to breathe because the pressure, uh, you know, starts developing. The pressure increases with the depth of the river and hence the diver sometimes starts uh, bleeding, okay? So point I'm trying to make, the liquid exerts pressure because of its height, okay? What height of the liquid we have? Solid objects exerts pressure because of its mass. Suppose this object is placed on a table, right? If this is placed on a table, so the mass of this is mg. So because of this force, it exerts pressure on the table. Solid exerts pressure because of its mass. Liquid exerts pressure because of its height. Gas exerts pressure because of its collision. Container, we have gases particle. When it collides with the wall, right? Because of that collision only, it exerts pressure. So all three different states of matter exerts pressure in different, different ways. Okay. Now, the one atmospheric pressure we have, it is observed to be, when you take 76 centimeter of Hg, this column, if you take, of 76 centimeter of Hg, whatever pressure we have here that we can calculate with this formula p is equals to h rho g this is 76 centimeter okay so pressure because of this height is rho we can take g we can take into the height h 76 centimeter whatever pressure we get that pressure is nothing but one atmospheric pressure and hence we define like this i hope it is clear to all of you Okay, understood? Yeah, next. Next we are going to see the various gas laws. Write down. Right on the gas law represents the relation between the relation between two variables at a time the relation between two variables at a time keeping the other variables constant. Okay, so first gaseous law we have, write down, that is Boyle's law. Write down, at constant temperature, at constant temperature for a given amount of gas
amount of gas the pressure is is inversely proportional to its volume to its volume okay so according to this boyle's law what we have we have constant temperature we have constant temperature and the relation is p is inversely proportional to p p is inversely proportional to v this is the boyle's law we have okay so if you write down a constant here so p is equals to k times 1 by v and hence we can write pv is equals to a constant right so for two different uh, states we can write p1 v1 is equals to p2 v2 any doubt in this no okay see this k is a constant and this constant is a function of temperature this k here is a function of temperature and how it is related to temperature it is observed that k is directly proportional to temperature okay based on this we'll draw the graph so the understanding of this is important okay graph will see before that we'll solve one question here look at this question calculate the the percentage change in pressure in pressure if the percentage change in volume is 25% try this is it 400% yeah i'll go one second Okay, I'll do this bit.
Okay. See this question. This question is, it says, the percentage change in volume is 25%. So first of all, it is not mentioned over here that volume is decreased by 25% or increased by 25%. It says the change is 25%. Are you getting it? Okay. The question it is saying about the change, it does not mention whether it has been increased or decreased. Okay. So both cases we have to assume. Like the case one, when the, you know, when the pressure increases, when the volume increases and case two, when the volume decreases. Right. So you see here, Case one, I am assuming, case one, that is volume is increasing. Since the thing is given is percentage, the data, so best way is to assume 100. Suppose V1 is 100, we have whatever unit, same 100. So V2 will be 125 because we have 25% increase. P1 is suppose 100 we have, then we can find out P2. Right, so we are assuming here the temperature constant, P2 we need to find out. So what we can write P1 V1 is equals to P2 V2, right? So P1 V1 is equals to P2 V2 if you apply. So you will get P2 is equals to 80. Is it 80? Means it is 20% decrease we have. The pressure decreases by 20%. Is it right? Yeah. Yeah. Minus 20% means Ritu, that 20% has been decreased. Okay. Minus means the uh, pressure has been decreased. Yeah. Now the second case you see, because both cases we have to assume. The second case is case two, when the volume decreases, when the volume decreases. So suppose V1 is 100, so V2, we have 25% decrease, so V2 would be 75. Again, assume P1 is equals to 100, we have to find out P2. So P1, V1 is equals to P2, V2 again. So P2 is equals to 100 into 100 divided by 75. 400 by 3, that is 133.3 uh, is the pressure we have. So there is an increase in pressure. So pressure increases by increases by 33.3%. Clear? Yes. Okay. Right. Now you see the graph of Boyle's law. Very important, this one is, okay. So write down the graphical representation. Graphical representation. 
this side we have pressure y axis and this side we have volume so since we have p into v is equals to constant is equals to constant so the graph is an hyperbolic graph goes like this it won't touch the x axis wait This is the graph of P, okay, at any temperature. Sometimes what happens, they'll give you the graph of P and V at different, different temperature, and they'll ask you to compare the relation of the temperature, like which one is more, which one is less, something like that. Suppose we have three graphs here, pressure and volume. One is this. Other one is this at three different temperature. Other one is this, right? Suppose this is T1, this is at T2, this is at T3. Okay. So how do we do compare the relation of T1, T2 and T3? For that, what we have to do? You draw any line, any horizontal line you can draw. You can also draw a vertical line, any one you can take. So I am drawing a horizontal line like this, any horizontal line you draw. Like I said, you can also draw a vertical line like this. Draw a horizontal line and then corresponding to the T1 temperature, the volume is this, then the volume is this, and then the volume is this for the three graph. Okay. So this is the volume we have for suppose V1, V2, and V3. Clearly you see V3 is maximum, right? V3 is maximum, hence T3 is also maximum. So we can write, because V and T are directly proportional, right, for a constant pressure. See, if I write down this, PV is equals to K, right? PV is equals to K. K is a function of temperature. We know it is directly proportional to the temperature. So for a constant pressure, because the line drawn is this, so for a constant pressure, the volume is also directly proportional to K, which is a function of temperature. So more value of V, more will be the value of K, and hence more will be the temperature. So we can write here easily from this graph, V3 is greater than V2, is greater than V1, which also suggests that T3 is maximum, then T2, and then T1. Yeah, once again, Shraddha. Draw this graph. Case one is this. Yeah. All of you understood this graph? Right, so this is a relation. We have very important relations, this. Okay, next graph you see. Next up we have the graph of pressure and volume and one by volume at a different different temperature. This graph is 
passing through origin a straight line because the equation is y is equals to mx in that form it is okay because you see we have p into is equals to k times into 1 by b so this is in the form of y is equals to mx the slope is x the slope is sorry k right so if the so the line it will be a straight line passing through the origin suppose this is t1 this is t2 and this is t3 okay the so slope of the line you can understand by this angle by this angle or by this angle okay so for t3 the slope is maximum and hence its k value is maximum right and when k value is maximum we know k is directly proportional to temperature so slope is maximum at t3 maximum at t3 hence t3 is maximum then t2 and then t1 tell me any doubt in this Yeah. Next graph you see. Y axis is PV and X axis is you can take pressure or you can take volume. For both the axis here, it is a straight line and constant because PV is equals to constant. It does not vary with pressure or volume. So it will be a straight line like this. Okay. And one more graph we have in this that is log P and log V. If you take Y axis as log P and X axis as log V, so we know P into V is equals to K, the constant. If you take log both sides, so log p into log v is equals to a constant log k. So we have log p is equals to log k plus minus log v. So you can see this, it is y is equals to mx plus c form we have with negative slope. So negative slope we can draw like this. Right. And the slope of this line is slope of this line is minus one. And this y intercept is nothing but log k, the constant we have. No doubt. Any doubt here? See, when you have the graph, no, y and x axis. So whatever the y and x axis you have, we just try to have a relation between the two. So since y axis is log p, x is log v, so we must have the relation of log p and log v, then we can analyze the graph of the two. So to get log p and log v, I have taken log in this expression. So log p into v is this, which further it becomes log p is equal to log k plus log v will come this side minus log v. Did you understand this log property, you know? Log property, you know? Yes, just use the log property and you'll get this. Now this is what you see, the y-axis is the y-axis is log p. So this is the y-axis. And this is the constant we have c. 
and this is the x axis we have log v right so this is x and the coefficient of x is nothing but m so this relation is what you see y is equals to mx plus c hence it is a straight line with a negative slope which is this clear so this is the first law we have okay that is boyle's law next you see the second one the second one is charles law charles law write down for a given amount of gas charles law you have to keep in mind that pressure is constant constant pressure so write down for a given amount of gas at constant pressure at constant pressure the volume is the volume is directly proportional proportional to its temperature so we have v directly proportional to t okay and further we can write it as v is equals to a constant k into t and for two different uh, you know set of data we can write v1 by t1 is equals to v2 by t2 here the constant k like in the last case the k is directly proportional to the temperature here this constant k is a function of pressure here and k here is inversely proportional to pressure more value of p less value of k okay again this relation gives you an idea of the graph okay now you see the graph here first graph is of v and t this is v and this is t so v and t graph it is again a straight line suppose at three, at three different pressure we have this that is p1 p2 and p3 could you tell me the relation of p1 p2 and p3 
Okay, let's see this. How do we do this? The best way is what? Like I said, draw a horizontal line. You can also draw a vertical line. Should I draw this? Should I do this a vertical line? Okay, chalo, I'll do this one for the vertical line. I'll draw this vertical line. Now this vertical line means along this line, the temperature is constant. Okay, so corresponding to P1, the volume is this V1, P2, the volume is this V2, and P3, the volume is this V3. Okay, so you see here, we get here as V1, this is V2, and this is V3. So obviously in this line you see, V3 is greater than V2 is greater than V1. And we know V and P are inversely proportional for constant temperature. So if V3 is max, then P3 is the least. So P3, then P2, P1. Easy. Tell me, any doubt? Slope also you can use. Yes, slope also you can use. Right? With the method of slope, what we can do, you see? See, V and T graph, V is equals to KT. So slope is, slope is K and K is inversely proportional to P. So as the slope increases, P decreases. See the graph here. This is the angle, the slope we have. We have maximum slope for P3. Right? It means the P3 is minimum and hence the same order we have. Right? Both way you can do. Okay. Next up we have log V and log T. This graph you see. This is suppose we have log V and this is suppose we have log T. Okay, how do you draw the graph? So we have V is equals to KT. So we'll take log both sides. So log V is equals to log K plus log T. Okay. So log V is equals to log K plus log T. So Y is equals to MX plus C. So we have a positive slope here. So the graph goes like this. A positive slope means the graph goes like this. This distance is nothing but the Y intercept, which is log K. Slope for this line is one for this line is one. Okay, now one more thing here. See the relation of Vt and temperature in degree Celsius scale is this the volume at any temperature T is equals to the volume at zero degree Celsius into one plus T divided by 273 where Vt is what? Vt is the volume at T degree Celsius and Vo is the volume at zero degree Celsius. Okay, 
temperature here this t in again in degree celsius okay so you see if t increases by 1 degree then the volume increases by 1 by 2273 degree okay so what we can write here if temperature t increases by 1 degree then the volume then the volume increases One by two seventy three times. Okay, because one you substitute here, so V T is equals to what we get if you substitute one, V naught plus one by two seventy three V naught. So this time the volume has been increased, right? So this one by two seventy three, this one by two seventy three, we call it as temperature coefficient of volume coefficient of volume that's the one thing if you see if t is equals to minus 273 degrees celsius if t is equals to minus 273 degrees celsius right which is nothing but 0 kelvin then then vt is 0 volume at temperature t is 0 right so this temperature where the volume becomes 0 we call it as absolute zero temperature absolute zero temperature volume of the gas becomes zero over here is the relation i have written properly here vt becomes v not plus this so these many times the volume increases 1 by 273 into v not so these many times the volume has been increased correct so this point that i have written it is based on this relation then okay next law the third law is it is gay lussac law gelsack law we have volume constant okay so write down the statement for a given amount of gas amount of gas at constant volume at constant volume the pressure is
is directly proportional. Directly proportional to temperature. Okay. So relation here is P is directly proportional to T, which further P is equals to K times T and K here is a function of volume and the relation of K and V is K is inversely proportional to volume. Right, inversely proportional to volume. P and T relation you see, we can write P1 by T1 is equals to P2 by T2. Okay. Similarly, P and T graph, if you draw, two graphs you'll see here. This graph is P versus T and this is log P versus log T. P versus T graph, it passes through origin, straight line. And I want you to tell me the relation of T1, T2 and T3. and T3. Okay, X axis is log P here. We have P is equals to KT. If you take log, so log P is equals to log k plus log t so it is again a straight line with a positive slope which is this so slope here is one is one and this intercept is log k and the graph is this here again what we do you can draw a horizontal line or you can compare with the slope directly uh, should we have V? Yes, we have V, my bad. Uh, log K, here we have V. V1, V2, V3. Yes. V1, V2, and V3. Right, similarly, we can compare this with the help of slope. So slope is maximum for V3. V3 has maximum slope and slope is nothing but K here, right? And K and volume is inversely proportional. K is maximum and hence the volume is minimum. So for the three we have here, V3 is minimum then V2 and then V1. This is the relation we have here. Or you can also draw a straight line either parallel to X axis or parallel to Y axis and solve this question. Okay, now you see this question. 
the question is a gas cylinder a gas cylinder can withstand can withstand a maximum pressure maximum pressure of 15 atmospheric pressure inside pressure inside the gas cylinder the gas cylinder at 27 degrees celsius is 10 atmospheric and the room in which the room in which cylinder is kept is kept catches fire predict the temperature the temperature at which the cylinder burst try this question Yeah, so you're getting 450 Kelvin. Yeah, that's right. 450 Kelvin is correct. Okay, so pressure simply you can apply. Okay, that is uh, Gay Lussac law, you can apply directly here. So it is given that the maximum pressure is 15 atmospheric, right? So when the pressure P1 is 10 atmospheric, right, and uh, Temperature T1 is given, that is 300 Kelvin. Always we'll take temperature in Kelvin here. P2 is given, the maximum pressure which the cylinder can withstand is 15 atmospheric, right? Temperature T2 is not given. Then we can apply P1 by T1 is equals to P2 by T2. And from this, we can find out T2. So the temperature at which the gas, the cylinder burst is 15 into 300 divided by 10, which is 450 Kelvin. The question was pretty simple. Okay, I gave you this question just to make, just to you know, um, emphasize on one thing here. And that is, sometimes what happens in this kind of question, they will give the melting point of cylinder is suppose 400. 
Kelvin. No, this gay lussac law protocol, it is for the gases. Okay. Uh, it is not in the reaction. We can apply the gases at two different state. Right, so when the two gases combines, there also we can apply, but here it is gases at two different states, a different pressure temperature we have. The statement of the two laws is different. If you look at the statement of combining volume of Gay-Lussac law, it is different and Gay-Lussac law for gas, it is different. Okay, so what I was uh, what I was discussing here, that sometimes what happens in this question is they give you the melting point of the cylinder is 400 Kelvin. In that case, the cylinder won't burst, okay, but it melts because the melting point is lesser than the temperature we have here at this stage, right? So keep that in mind. If melting point, right on, if melting point of the cylinder is 400 Kelvin, then the cylinder will not burst, but it melts. then the cylinder will not burst, but it melts. Okay, so the next one is the law that we had already discussed. Okay, I'll just quickly go through it. The fourth one is The fourth one is uh, Avogadro's law. Avogadro's law, or we also call it as Avogadro's hypothesis. It says what? At constant temperature and pressure. At constant temperature and pressure the volume occupied by the gas is directly proportional to its number of moles. That is the amount of the gas. This, this one we have already done in chapter one. That is the mole concept. Okay. Okay. One note here you write down. Write down the molecules with equal number of moles. Molecules with equal number of moles may or may not have may or may not have equal number of atoms number of atoms due to due to different atomicity due to different atomicity. Atomicity means what? Like helium is monoatomic gas, oxygen is diatomic gas. Okay, all those things, atomicity. So this means what? Suppose we have two container at the same temperature and pressure, right? PT here and PT here are same. And we have here X atom of, X atom of O2 
and here we have y atom of O3. Could you compare the volume occupied by O2 and O3? Which option is correct? Could you tell me? V of O2 is equals to V of O3. Option A. Option B is V of O2 is greater than V of O3. Option C is V of O2 is less than V of O3. And option D is cannot determine which option is correct here. So I'm getting three different answers. Achha. Tell me one thing, X atom of O2, could you tell me how many molecules of oxygen we have here? Number of molecules. X by two. And here the number of molecules is X by three. So number of molecules in O2, it is more, right? Number of molecules in O2, it is more. And when you have the number of molecules, you can find out the number of moles here. Moles equals to what? X by two into Na. And here it is X by three into Na. So which one has more number of moles? Could you tell me? Acha, y atoms we have. Yes, yes. Oh, I got, I've written Y. Fine. Okay, guys. By mistake, I have written this Y atoms. Obviously, if you have X and Y, then the option D is correct. There's no doubt about it because we don't have relation of X and Y. So there's no relation. We cannot determine, uh, you know, uh, the, the volume of O2 and O3. But suppose if I give you Y is equals to 2X, this kind of relation it is, if it is given, then we can find out the relation of the two. Or let us make it simpler. I just want to make you understand this relation. If it is Y, then cannot be determined. Answer is that. Now, suppose if it is X, Right, I was thinking that we have X atom I have taken here, but suppose if it is X we have, for example, I'm taking this as X, just for instance. Then we have the number of uh, moles of O2 is more than to that of O3, right? In that case, the number of moles of O2 is more and moles and volume are directly proportional. So we can say the volume of O2 is greater than the volume of O3. Okay, so obviously X and Y relation we have here, the relation is not given. Okay, so it is, uh, so it cannot be determined. Okay, option D is correct over here. Okay, just ignore it. Okay, or by any means they have given the relation of X and Y, then also you can compare the volume. Okay. Now, we see we have discussed the four different laws here, right? Out of the four, I'm considering three here. Let's see which one I'm considering. Okay, I'm considering Boyle's law. I'm considering Charles law. Charles law and I'm considering Avogadro's law. 
that is B C A. Okay, Boyle's Charles Avogadro B C A. Boyle's law is what B and P are inversely proportional. Charles' law is V and T is directly proportional. Avogadro's law is V and N is directly proportional. If you combine all three, if you combine all three, then we can say V is directly proportional to N and T and inversely proportional to P. Further, we can write it as PV is directly proportional to NT. And when you remove this proportionality sign, we'll get a constant here. And this constant PV is equals to NRT, where R is the universal gas constant. Universal gas constant. Okay, R is the universal gas constant. The same relation we have already done that is, um, you know, ideal gas equation. We also call it as equation of state. Okay, this equation is the ideal gas equation. Since it is derived from the various gas laws, so all the condition of gas law is true over here also. Like if you take for a given amount of gas means number of moles is constant and at constant temperature, PV is equals to constant Boyle's law. For a given amount of gas, number of moles constant, at constant pressure, V is directly proportional to T, that is Charles law. And similarly, we have Avogadro's law also. Since it is derived from the, all the three gaseous uh, gases law, then the condition of gases law also holds true over here. Okay, now you try to understand the values of R here. Okay, these values you have to memorize, I'll give you that value. Okay, so value of R you see, R is equals to universal gas constant. It is 8.314 Joule per mole Kelvin, SI unit. R is also equals to 0 0.0821 liter ATM per mole Kelvin or it is also equals to the exact value is 1.98 which approximately we consider as 2 calorie per mole Kelvin. Okay, so these three values of R we have. Then, now, what is the significance of R, right? The significance of R, if you try to understand here, what is the unit of, I know, Joule we have here, Joule is the unit of which term? Energy, work done, right? What is the formula of work done? F dot ds, you must have done in physics. Yeah, once again, Dave, let me finish this. Yeah, F dot ds, work done is F dot ds, correct? So, and work done is also pressure into volume, right? Against the pressure, what is the change in volume we have? That is also work done. 
So P into V is also work done. Don't write this, just you see here. Work done in physics, you have already done. It is F dot DS, force into displacement. We also write it as pressure into volume, the work done. Right. Unit of work done is the unit of energy that is Joule. Okay, as a unit. Pressure volume unit, if you put, it is ATM for pressure and volume is liter. So liter ATM is also the unit of work done. You see, Joule is the work done, calorie is the work done, and liter ATM is also the work done. Okay, so if you look at the expression of R we have, the R expression is R is equals to, we have pressure into volume divided by divided by moles into temperature. Right? So pressure is what? Pressure is force per unit area, F by A. Volume is what? Volume, we can write length, length cube divided by mole into temperature. So you see area is what? Area is length square. Here we have length cube. So we can write this as force into length and that becomes the work done divided by moles into temperature. So R is what? R is the, this force into length, it becomes the work done. So R we can write, it is a work done per unit mole and per unit temperature. R is nothing but the significance is, R is the WD work done per unit mole and per unit mole per unit temperature. Any doubt? Okay, one another form of this you see, we have written PV is equals to NRT. I have done this expression already. So pressure is equals to number of moles is mass divided by this volume into, we'll write one by M, capital M, the molecular mass of the gas into RT. Mass by molecular mass is number of moles. So mass by volume is becomes the density. P is equals to D is the density into RT by M. So we can write the another form of ideal gas equation density is equals to P into M by RT, where M is the molecular mass of the gas. Molecular mass of the gas. If you have a mixture of gases, mixture of gas, we can write D is equals to PM average is divided by RT. This is the relation we have. Then Yeah, so we'll have a break now guys. Okay, 
and we'll resume the class at 6.40. Okay, we'll have 10 minutes break since our class is still 7.30 only. We have three hour class today because of your exam because tomorrow NAPL guys has some exam, maths exam they have. So we have three hour session till 7.30 we have class. So we are taking 10 minutes break, right? So you can have your snacks quickly and then you can come back at 6.40. Fine. Take a break. Yeah.
Hello. Yes. Shall we start? Okay. So the next is see what happens. Suppose you have a gas present in a container, right? So the gas exerted by uh, the pressure exerted by the gas is called the pressure of the gas, right? So total pressure is because of the pressure of the individual gases. So when you have a mixture of gas present, if you have only one gas, then whatever the pressure of the gas, that will be the total pressure. But if you have a mixture of gas, for example, don't draw this. For example, suppose in this, we have many gases present in this mixture of gases we have. Then what is the total pressure here in this case, when we have more than one gas present? Okay. So in case of more than one gas, that is, no, with no mixing means gases are not reacting with each other. Right. Then the total pressure will be the pressure exerted by the individual gas, the sum of the pressure exerted by the individual gas means suppose we have A, B, C, three gas present in this container, right? Non-reacting gases, correct? So total pressure because of these three gases will be the sum of the pressure because of the gas A, then pressure because of the gas B plus pressure because of the gas C. This is the total pressure we have. Now this thing is observed by a scientist called Dalton and this we call it as Dalton's law of partial pressure. Okay, so write down the heading here first. The heading is Dalton's law of partial pressure. Write down. The total pressure exerted by the total pressure exerted by a mixture of non reacting gases the total pressure exerted by a mixture of non reacting gases in a container right pressure exerted by a mixture of gases, mixture of non-reacting gases in a container at temperature T or at any temperature is equals to the sum of the partial pressure of the individual gases. Okay, again, I'm repeating. The total pressure exerted by a mixture of non-reacting gases at any temperature equals to the sum of the partial pressure equals to the sum of the partial pressure of the individual component, individual gases. Okay, so the condition is what the condition is we must have non-reacting gases. Right. Means the gases which is present in the container are not reacting. When condition is not that sufficient enough so that the gases react with each other. So non-reacting gases we have. One term I have used here, that is partial pressure. So what is partial pressure? Write down. It is the pressure it is the pressure that would exert by it is the pressure that would exert by by the gas if it is by the gas if it occupies the container alone.
okay pressure exerted by the gas if it occupies the container alone so suppose we have a a container gaseous container in which i am assuming three gases are present okay we have a right we have b and we have c these three gases are present into this so a will have its own pressure b will have its own and c will have its own pressure okay so the total pressure according to dalton's law pt the total pressure is equals to the pressure exerted by a this is called the partial pressure of a the pressure exerted by b partial pressure of b pressure exerted by c that is a partial pressure of c so this is the dalton's law statement total pressure is the sum of the partial pressure of the individual component pt is equals to pa plus pb plus pc remember this gases are non reacting gases if it is not given then also you have to assume that that the gases are non reacting okay now you see what happens if you since the volume of the container suppose i am assuming the volume as v volume as v so volume of gas a is v gas b is v gas c is v because we consider the the volume of the gas is the volume of the container in which it is present okay so for all gases the volume is v so if we apply ideal gas equation ideal gas equation for each component one by one means for gas a b and c so what we can write the partial pressure of a that is pa is equals to na rt by v v is the volume of the container similarly we can write pb and pc also pb is equals to nb rt by v and pc is equals to and c r t by p so according to dalton's law if you calculate the total pressure pt is equals to the sum of all the three so we'll take r t by v common and this becomes na plus nb plus nc any doubt in this no right now you see this rt by v we can replace this this rt by v we can replace in terms of pressure of a or in terms of pressure of b or in terms of pressure of c we have all three choices here right you see because rt by v is there in all the expression right so whatever we want we can do if you want to express rt by v in terms of pc and nc we can do that pb nb we can do that pa na we can do that so so i am taking one reference here i am taking pa and na so rt by v is what pa by na so we can write here pt is equals to partial pressure of a divided by the number of moles of a into na plus nb plus nc okay just cross multiply this if you cross multiply this then what we get you see we get here the partial pressure of any component here it is a is equals to the total pressure into the number of moles of a divided by na plus nb plus nc which is the total number of moles because we have only three component we are assuming what is this expression could you tell me what is this expression it's the mole fraction very good right so it is the mole fraction so the formula we get here is what the formula we get here this term becomes the mole fraction of a and hence the expression is this the partial pressure of any individual component pa is equals to the mole fraction of that component into total pressure 
Similarly, if RT by V, you substitute in terms of V, you will get this relation. That is the partial pressure of B is equals to the mole fraction of B into the total pressure. And if you replace this with C, you'll get PC is equals to, you'll get partial pressure of C is equals to the mole fraction of C into total pressure. Clear? No doubt? See, one thing you can easily conclude here, because partial pressure depends upon the mole fraction and mole fraction will be more when number of moles will be more. So the component which has the maximum number of moles, that will have the maximum partial pressure and it will contribute maximum into the total pressure of the gases. One second. Okay, so the one which has the more number of moles, the one which has the more number of moles, that will have the mole, more number of more mole fraction and hence more partial pressure. And we can say that particular gas will contribute more into the total pressure of the mixture. Is it clear? No doubt? Yeah. One question you see here. The question is, we have a container and in this container, we have different, different amount of gases, different, different gases present. For example, I have taken 16 gram of O2. Okay. I have taken 80 gram, 80. 80 gram of SO3. We have 24 gram of CH4 methane. Okay. And 96 gram of O3. This is the mixture of gas we have. Okay. We need to find out. And one more thing temperature is given. Temperature is 227 degrees Celsius. Degrees Celsius. Take care of this, right? Volume of the container is 10 liter, right? R value, we are assuming 0 0.08, you can assume. You need to find out the mole fraction of each gases, mole fraction and the PP, means partial pressure of each gases. Let me know once you're done.
Okay, fine, I'll do this. You can check your answers. See, first of all, since the mass is given, so we'll find out the number of moles. So the number of moles for O2 is equals to, the mass is 16, 16 divided by 32. So we have one by two moles. Number of moles of um, CH4 that is 24 gram it is given divided by 16 so it is 3 by 2 moles number of moles of SO3 the mass is given that is 80 gram 80 divided by 80 only it is 1 mole Number of moles of O3, that is 96 divided by 48, is equals to 2 moles. Now, I told you that the one which has more number of moles, that will have the more mole fraction, and hence the partial pressure will be more. So with this number of moles, you can actually write down the order of partial pressure, which is not the question here. Question is not that. But suppose if you have to arrange the gases in order to their partial pressure, then you don't have to calculate the partial pressure of each gas. Directly with number of moles, we can say, like for here, we can easily say partial pressure of O3 is the maximum. Then we have partial pressure of what? Can you tell me? Maximum for O3 and then we have for CH4 because the number of moles of CH4 is more. And then we have the partial pressure of SO3. And then we have the partial pressure of O2. So this is one thing. If you get this kind of questions, then you don't have to calculate the partial pressure for each gas and then find out the order. Directly with number of moles, we can say, because the partial pressure PP is directly proportional to the number of moles of that particular component. Okay, however, the question is not this, but you must have the uh, understanding of this also okay now we need to calculate the mole fraction mole fraction of this is what x of o2 is equals to half divided by half plus 3 by 2 plus 1 plus 2 i'll just do this sum here only just for the so half is 0 0.5 3 by 2 is 1.5 so 1 1.5 plus 0 0.5 2 plus 2 4 plus 4 1 so we have five moles we have total number of moles so it is one by ten we get here mole fraction of o2 mole fraction of ch4 is three by two divided by five is equals to three by ten we have okay mole fraction of so3 is equals to one divided by five okay mole fraction of o3 is equals to 2 divided by 5. Okay, so this is a mole fraction we have for each component. Now, total pressure, you know, because temperature, volume, and R value is given. So you can find out the total. What is your total pressure here? Did you calculate total pressure? PT is equals to NRT by V. N is 5. R is 0 0.0208. T is, we have uh, 227, so 500 Kelvin, divided by the volume is 10. So this we are getting, I'm sorry. One second, or oh, what is this happening? Yeah. 
yeah this pressure is 20 atmospheric we get and then we can find out partial pressure is equals to mole fraction into total pressure so mole fraction of or partial pressure of o2 is equals to mole fraction is 1 by 10 into 20 that is 2 atmospheric the partial pressure of uh, ch4 is uh, CH4 is 3 by 10. So 3 by 10 into 20. That is 6 atmospheric. The partial pressure of SO3 is 1 divided by 5 into 20. That is 4 atmospheric. Partial pressure of O3 is equals to 2 by 5 into 20. 2 by 5 into 20 that is equals to 8 atmospheric. You can always cross check your answer because the sum of this value must be 20 atmospheric. If you're not getting the sum as the total pressure that you have calculated, means this is not following Dalton's law, which should not be correct, means you have done something wrong in the question. Okay, answer is this. Any doubt in this? Okay, one more question we'll discuss on this. Suppose we have a container. And in this container, we have two gas, H2 and CH4 is present. We have taken equal weight of equal weight of H2 and CH4. And the question is, look at the sentence here, calculate, calculate the fraction of total pressure, fraction of total pressure exerted by H2. Try this question. Eight by nine. Yeah. So eight by nine is the correct. Eight by nine is the answer. Okay. So first of all, you understand this. What is the question? Question is calculate the fraction of total pressure exerted by H2. Okay. So we need to find out fraction of total pressure, right? So we need to find out the pressure is equals to pressure exerted by H2 since it is a fraction. So this divided by total pressure PT. This is the question we have. 
fraction of total pressure exerted by H2 is this. And when you look at this ratio, this ratio is nothing but what? Could you tell me? This ratio is nothing but the mole fraction of H2, isn't it? Because mole partial pressure is equals to mole fraction in total pressure. So this is what the question is. So we need to find out the mole fraction. That is what the question is. First of all, you need to understand this. Now, what is given here? It is given that equal weight. So I've assumed m gram of H2 and m gram of CH4. Okay. So the number of moles of H2 is m divided by 2. Number of moles of CH4 is m divided by 16. Okay. So we have the number of moles, so we can find out the mole fraction. So X of H2 is equals to M by 2 divided by M by 2 plus M by 16. This is what you need to solve. You will get 8 by 9. Yes, this is what you have done. Tell me, this is what you have done. All of you, right? Yes, so we have an alternate way for this. Better way, alternate way we have. I'll show you that. Okay, by this you can do that, but it will take some time. Okay, first of all, you see this question. This question was asked in J. Exactly same question they have asked in J. And how do we do this? The alternate method is what? You see this. Since they have, no, the question is equal weight of H2 and CH4 we have, right? So we have H2 and we have CH4. So since we have equal weight, so you just assume the weight of the two gases, anything you assume. Molecular mass is what? Two gram we have for H2 and it is 16 gram. You see this 2 and 16 are multiple of each other, right? 2 into 8 is 16. So in JE till now, the question that they ask on this, they have always given the gases whose molecular weight are multiple of each other. That is what we have observed. If, there, if the gases molecular weight are not in multiple, then we'll have a bit of more calculation, but we can do by this method. Okay, so the best way is what? Whenever you have this question, equal mass we have, then assume the weight, since the equal weight is given, so any weight you assume here. You can assume 10, 15, 20, 50, anything you can assume. But that mass will be same for H2 and CH4. Anything you can assume. And then you can solve that. You'll get the answer. But to reduce the time and get your answer in the lesser time, what I'm telling you, that assumptions should be like that, so that the mass that you are taking here, it should be, a multiple of the molecular mass of the two gases. And most of the time, if you take, see the two gram and 16 gram you have, the one, both are the multiple of each other. The one which is higher, that is 16 gram, you assume I have taken 16 gram of H2 and 16 gram of CH4. This you can assume. So once you know the mass, the number of moles is what? We have eight moles for H2 and we have one mole of CH4. Then what is the mole fraction? X of H2. The mole of H2 divided by the total number of moles, 8 plus 1. That is 9. Isn't it easy? Yeah, this one is easier. Right? So till now, this thing that we have observed, that whenever they ask this kind of question, they have given the gas whose molecular mass are multiple of each other. Right, then the one whose molecular mass is higher, the same molecular mass, you assume the mass of the two gases which is taken. And then divide by molecular mass, you'll get the number of moles and then mole fraction. Okay, done. Okay, 
Next, write down. That is kinetic theory of gases. And I think in your school exam, till here only they have done. Have done kinetic theory of gases in school? Yes. Yeah, so I think uh, your, your school portions has been done, it's covered, no? Yeah, for this chapter it is done. Thermodynamics we cannot do, can you, right? Because we have to discuss a lot of things. We are not only, uh, you know, studying for the school exam. Our main purpose is competitive exam, right? So I cannot skip topics in any chapter, right? I have to do everything, whatever it is there. Okay, then, I, then only I can change the top chapter, okay? So thermodynamics, unfortunately, you have to do on your own, okay? When I take uh, this particular chapter, we'll do everything into that. Fine, not a problem. See, first of all, we are talking about, till now we are talking about ideal gas, ideal gas every time, right? Ideal gas is just an assumption, okay? All of you listen to me carefully. Ideal gas is just an assumption. Actually, none of the gases behaves as an ideal gas. It's basically, we have some assumption and based on assumption only, we define, okay, the gas is ideal gas, if those assumptions are there. But actual, practically, if you see, all the gases are non-ideal gas, which we call it as real gases, okay? So the theory of ideal gas that we have, it is an hypothetical theory. It is based on our assumption. So what are assumptions? Assumptions is given under this kinetic theory of gases for ideal gas, right? So this chapter has two portions. One is for ideal a gas that that is what we have done till now various gas law and all and then the other portion is for real gas okay which will also see what is the difference between ideal and real gas we have and the other concepts for real gas the real gas for the portion is not given in your uh, textbook like it's given but they are not doing it now they have deleted the portion right but for competitive exam the real gas portion is more important than ideal gas portion right so we cannot skip that so kinetic theory of gases, the assumptions given for ideal gas and the assumptions are here, write down the assumptions of of KTG. In this, we have a derivation over here, but derivation they haven't asked ever in the exam. So we won't do that. We just see the result for that. Okay. So the first assumption you write down First assumption you write down, there's no force of attraction between the molecules. There is no force of attraction, no force of attraction between the molecules. Means IMF is zero, it is saying. Intermolecular force is not there. IMF is zero, right? Assumption is the second one is the volume of the molecule, gaseous molecule, the volume of the gaseous molecule is negligible in comparison to in comparison to the volume of of the container in which it is kept
second assumption is this. First two are the most important one, okay? This only makes the difference between real gas and ideal gas. So we'll take up these two points also later, okay? Next. The molecule of gases of gases are always in random but straight line motion. Random but in straight line motion with uniformly distributed speed with uniformly distributed speed in all direction. Copy this down, I'll go back to the next slide. Done, all of you? Yeah. Fourth point. The direction of molecules the direction of molecules changes only if it collides with collides with the other molecules or or the wall of the container. Okay. This collision here, the collision is perfectly elastic. is perfectly elastic, which means what? There is no loss of energy during collision. Means no loss of energy during collision. The last point is the effect of gravity gravity on the molecular motions is negligible.
Done? Yeah. So we have three types of molecular speeds also here. Okay. Um, and this is speed we get from the Maxwell distribution curve of the speeds which we'll discuss next class okay because if you start this we won't be able to finish it today okay so i'm not starting that maxwell distribution curve the discussion of graph we are not doing today okay so right now next there are three types of molecular speeds for gaseous particles we have three molecular speeds three types of molecular speeds For competitive exam, this portion is important, means the concept is not that much here. We just have the formula of these three speeds, okay? Based on the formula only you'll get questions. You just need to know the formula, okay? Uh, however, the formula I'm giving to going to give you today is not that important. The one that we'll discuss next class when we do the graph and all those, all those, all those things, those formulas are important, okay? But this understanding also you must have. The first, uh, you know, types of molecular speed we have, we call it as average speed. Average speed. Average speed is represented as V average. This is the average speed. Suppose we have 10 molecules moving with V1, V2, V3, V10 like that. Okay. So what is V average? Simply average formula, you need to write it down. So V average is equals to V1 plus V2 plus V3 Vn divided by the number of gases, that is N, V average is this, okay? The second one is most probable speed. Most probable speed. Most probable speed is represented by VMP. Most probable speed. Write down. It is the speed of it is the speed of most of the molecules, most of the molecules. So suppose we have five different molecules moving with the speed, say V1 is five meter per second. V2 is also five meter per second. V3 is three meter per second. V4 is five meter per second. And V5 is, suppose we have again two meter per second. Okay, so it is the speed of the most of the molecules. Like so out of five, three molecules are moving with five meter per second. Hence, yes, yes, correct. Correct, Kenshuk. So basically, it is the most probable speed for this given set of data is five meter per second. This is what it means. This is the most probable speed. Okay. Obviously, this formula is not important. You are not going to use this formula to solve the questions. We'll have a different formula for all the three speeds. One more we'll discuss now. Those formulas are important. We'll discuss next class. Okay. One more type of speed you write down next. All of you have done here.
third type that is root mean square speed root mean square speed that is vrms in short we write it as vrms it is the square root it is a square root of mean of mean of square of all speeds so the formula is vrms is equals to we have v1 square plus v2 square plus v3 square vn square divided by the number of gases particle n and root over of it it's completely under root okay this is root mean square speed okay so this is the three types of uh, molecular speeds we have for the gases okay so next class uh, we'll continue with this we'll see the kinetic gas equation and then we'll see the formula of again these three speeds and maxwell distribution curve will discuss this portion this part is very important okay you have to understand each and every part over here okay fine so guys tell me uh, till when you have exam the school exam when is the last last exam both nafl and uh, nps 16th october okay what about nafl fine okay so the thing is you know since you won't be able to do the assignments now but uh, you know whenever if you get time you can start solving the center module for gaseous state okay that is your assignment okay start solving that okay whenever you get time uh, i will share uh, one or two more pdf under this right that also you can try later on okay Uh, i'll tell you you need to upload it on class pro okay it's very simple you just have to log in and then steps you need to follow like you have to click on that browse select the you know file and upload it that is it a uh, class pro is a you know class management platform okay we can track your uh, all activity of yours over there over there right you know assignment submission as attendance everything we can track over there so we we are using it from the past couple of years we are using it but now we are you know trying to use it on a full fledged basis uh, i'll let you know shraddha i'll let you know uh, everything if you have any concern you can get in touch with me anyone okay and those who does not who you know um, uh, does not have the credentials for class pro you can text me i'll just look into it once Yes, yes. It requires login credentials. I will provide that. Okay. Yeah, right. So now you focus on your exam. Okay. I will let you know what to do. Okay, guys. Thank you. Take care. Anything else? Okay. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Thank you.